Hello and welcome back to Unpopular People. We believe that listening and learning from each other is key for personal development and success. Today in our interview, Rusty Hodge. Rusty is the general manager for Soma FM. He has different channels on there, for example, Group Salad. If you haven't heard it before, you should check it out straight away. If you want to find out more about Unpopular People, please visit our website www.unpopularpeople.com and sign up for our newsletter. And now enjoy this episode with Rusty Hodge. All right. Hello, Rusty. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Uh, how are you over there in California? <laughs> well, it's a it's actually a really beautiful day here in San Francisco. Blue skies with a few little clouds, and it's surprisingly warm for this time of year, which is a little scary. You're in winter <laughs> at the moment, are you? We're in winter, and normally at this time of the year, it'd be about 10 degrees colder than it is, but, you know... Things are changing. For the short term, I don't <laughs> mind it being a little warmer, but for the long term, I find it very worrying. Yeah, it is for sure. We've had like, quite a, we've had quite a drought here in California as well, which uh, you know we really need the water. And when we don't, you know, get the rain we're supposed to get in February, it didn't rain at all in uh, in February so far. So it's a little scary. Yeah, it's things are changing. Um, yeah, we sometimes have to adapt. Sometimes you know we have to change things around us to um, you know make things better. But let's start from the beginning because. Um, some of our listeners don't know you and we usually start with uh, the same question and it is where were you born and how did you grow up like maybe you can tell us a little bit about hmm. your childhood okay uh, I was born in Southern California in a, in a I guess a suburb of Los Angeles called the city of Orange um, and uh, I always liked music I always liked radio uh, I was uh, lucky enough to get a tape recorder. My grandfather bought me a tape recorder for my birthday or Christmas, something when I was pretty young, and I had so much fun playing with that tape recorder. And uh, then at one point in time, um, I was probably like maybe around eight or nine at this time, um, we lived very close to Disneyland. Uh, and uh, at the Disneyland Hotel, there was a radio station that had their studios in the hotel for a while. The station was KEZY. And my parents or my dad took me there to like look through the window and watch what they were doing. And I was mesmerized. And I think that's when I said, I want to get into radio. Was it for you like when you when you like children look into like a cockpit of an airplane, like when you see yeah. all the buttons and yeah. things? And it was that kind of it's like it's like, oh, because I already had a tape recorder. This is even better than a <laughs> tape recorder. And and so, you know, I'd listen to the radio a lot. And I, you know, I really liked listening to the radio as a kid. And uh And then seeing it made just was, you know, very exciting to me. So, um, you know, I went on to do things like uh, I started a little pirate radio station in my neighborhood. Uh, you know, it only transmitted a few blocks. Mm -hmm. um, but um, how old were you then when blocks. this? When you did this? Uh, I was probably like I was probably like thirteen or fourteen. Uh huh. Maybe maybe yeah maybe fifteen. It was you know before I was sixteen. And uh, so, you know, I did a radio show on that, and I didn't know if anybody listened. And <laughs> But it was it was fun to pretend that there were people who were listening. It was 1600 AM mm -hmm. on the medium wave dial. And, uh, and how, did you, how did you know, like, how to oh, stream? Like, how did you know, like, the technical so part? So I got my, – my dad's, uh, you know, been a computer engineer all his life, and he always had some new, new technologies and stuff around and. He had this very early prototype of a cordless telephone that actually transmitted on the AM band. Uh, and I thought, wait, I can listen to this cordless telephone on my AM radio. I bet if I hooked up the output from my tape recorder to the, you know, the, where the phone jack would be on this thing, it would work. And it did. <laughs> and so I, I kind of like lucked into creating an AM transmitter that way. Wow. And that was, that was quite a blast. Um, just like, you know, even if I had no audience, just knowing that, you know, you were broadcasting really felt good. Wow. Okay. And did you, um, do you play any instruments or did you learn any instruments during this time as well? Yeah, I've always, I've always been kind of musical. I started out playing the drums when I was real little. Um, and then, uh, later on, like in high school, I, I took over, um, uh, I sort of gave up the drums and started playing guitar and keyboards more. I was never a great guitarists are never a great keyboard player but i uh, i got a hold of a synthesizer 
probably when I was like 17 or 18 and really started getting into electronic music and, uh, or, you know, creating electronic music, I should say. Nothing spectacular great, but it was really fun. I really liked doing it. It really like opened me up to all these different types of sounds that you could make music with. Do you um, uh, uh, release music as well from yourself, like um, like on your own under your own name, or do you like how can you f how can I find I your music? I do have. <laughs> I did a I, bit of research, and it was a... was very hard for me. To, I wanted to listen to some of your stuff, but it's uh, yeah. So I I kind of hide it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really. I kind of do it anonymously, but I do have some. You know, I, there's a SoundCloud page up there with probably like about 15 different tracks of stuff I've done in the last five years. Um, But I'm more, you know, I I mostly put that music up to uh, uh, share with some other musician friends of mine, and it's not really like meant for public consumption. Although I will admit, there's like two tracks I do play of mine on some FM, and uh, um, I've actually gotten some positive reactions from like one of the tracks, which was kind of nice, where someone says, "Oh, I like I like that song. Play it more often." Um, But normally I try to, I just try to be anonymous about that. I don't want to, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't want people to think of me as a musician because I'm really not. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, yeah, not for me. <laughs> It's like your taste of music. <laughs> like I have to say it to the audience as well. Like um, I've been listening to Soma FM and Groove Salad. We get to this a, a little bit later when we explain what this all means and where that's, uh, yeah, what, what it is. But I've been listening to your station for such a long time. And it's um, for me, this is like this interview is something very, very uh, special and oh, important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, It means a lot. So I was wondering, um, do you have like a music background? Like, do your parents um, did something similar to like what you do, or like, um, to, like do they broadcast music well, as well? You know, like, so um, my mom was a piano teacher, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, she you know she retired from her piano teaching after I was born, um, but uh, she was teaching piano while she was pregnant with me. So she always said like, "Oh, you're very musical because like all while you were you know." developing in my womb you were hearing all this music from me teaching piano to people and uh and i think my dad also sort of he was a big fan of like uh tape recorders and making radio programs and stuff you know if he if he was alive today and doing he was young today he would um he'd be making podcasts mm -hmm. uh so you know there is some of that history and uh and i guess there's also because of that there was a lot of encouragement from my parents to to go in that direction And do you have any siblings? I do. Yes, yeah. I have two sisters, but they're very different. From okay. Me. They do something completely different, like not into music. Yeah. Okay. No, um, no, it's funny. It's like, uh, I mean, you know, they enjoy listening to music as much as the average person, but, you know, they don't collect records. They don't, uh, I don't even think they go to concerts or anything, but um, mm. yeah, they're just, you know. One's a, one's a science teacher, at a, a high school science teacher, and the other one is a uh, an English professor. So <laughs> mm -hmm. very different from me. And so like after you did your first broadcasting with your self-made radio station and everything, uh, what happened afterwards? So did you finish high school? Did you go to a university or yeah, college? I, or? Um, yeah, so um, during high school and after I was doing the, the pirate radio stuff, Uh, I started getting into a little bit of, um, you would call me like an amateur phone freak, where uh, I had a bunch of other friends and we knew we, we'd like explore things on the telephone system, you know, kind of like pre-computer hacking. And uh, one of my friends had set up a dial-a-joke and I thought, that's a great idea. So I kind of copied him and I figured out a way to build an answering machine um, with a lot of his help uh, that would, uh, you know, you know, I use these modified eight-track cartridges that uh, we would have like three or four different uh, little 30-second, 40-second comedy routines on them. And so you'd call up, and it would play you one, and then it would hang up. And you could call back and play another one, you'd hang up. And, uh, and that introduced me to there's, there's a There's a large number of people spread around the country that were all doing, you know, kind of like we're doing in podcasting now, but, you know, they were doing it over telephone lines, you know, recorded tele you know, telephone entertainment, they called it. Um, so after I did the dial -a joke, I started doing a thing that was like a, uh, it was like a radio talk show where we had two phone numbers. One was just a normal answering machine where people would call in and talk about something they were interested in. And then I would take all those, edit them together, 
and put in my own commentary, add some production music and other stuff around it. And, uh, and then there'd be another number you'd call into, and then you could listen to that program. So again, it was sort of like a precursor to podcasting. Um, not really scalable, right? Because if you had a 30 minute program and only one person could listen to it at a time, you know, what's that 50 people a day maximum listening to it. And to listen to it, like you'd often have to call in, you get a busy signal and you call back five minutes later and, you know, luckily maybe you'd get in at some point in time. Not nearly as easy to listen to as it is to listen to a podcast these days or yeah. internet radio or anything. Yeah, it'd make it very But convenient. again, it was like, <laughs> it, it was a, it was a real fun thing to do. And it, uh, uh, you know, it, it just kind of reinforced that I really enjoyed um, doing like, well, I, I don't want to say social media because this is before, you know, social media type things, but uh, a media interaction with like lots of people. So, uh, and then after that, uh, when I went to college, um, I went to Chapman University in Orange County and uh, they had a radio station that had been off the air for like five or six years. So I found one or two other people who were interested in getting it started. One guy was the business person. The other one was, uh, he, he later went on to be a producer for a very large rock radio station in Los Angeles. Um, you know, he was sort of like the programming guy. And then I was doing more like the, um, I was acting as like the, um, general manager and engineering manager of the station. So I would, do things like I basically we built the station I did I designed it and got all the equipment together and you know we hired a contractor to build us a room in one of the college's buildings that you know made the studio um it was a blast and you know we I organized about I don't know between uh probably like 40 and 50 different people turns oh. out there's like this huge desire for people to do radio shows yeah <laughs> and uh which yeah, which yeah, we're really talking. Fun. Which yeah, we're talking about. This was in the this was in the early eighties. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember the exact year. Probably like eighty one, eighty two. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, we had a we had a lot of fun with the uh, uh, getting people on the air and helping them do stuff. And I did a lot of education, like told them what I had learned, you know, f the hard way from doing things wrong. Mm -hmm. And mostly people told I mostly told people what not to do because it didn't work because it. You know, I'd already learned that was not the good thing to do. Um, and we were loosely associated with the um, uh, the theater department. So we got a lot of uh, um, extrovert personalities who were really fun and enjoyable to do, you know, to do radio shows. And some of it was talk programming and some of it was a combination of music and talk. And, uh, um, you know, then I, this is, though, when I learned that radio was not all it was cracked up to be as a career because when I went on to try to find some job and work in radio, did a little internship in it, I found out that the only way to make money in radio was to be on the ad sales side. It wasn't to be on the programming side and it wasn't even to be on, you know, like even like the general manager of a radio station usually got to their position from being in sales first. So that was, um, very frustrating um, reality dose for me. And it kind of made me feel like, yeah, I'm never going to be successful in radio unless I can run my own radio station. And, you know, in the, in the mid eighties, late eighties is when all the American radio deregulation happened and all the corporations came in and started buying up all the little small radio stations. Instead of, in the old days, there were rules that uh, you could own seven FM stations, seven AM stations, and seven TV stations at the most. And that got changed and suddenly you could own an unlimited number of stations. And it ended up turning, you know, it that, in my opinion, is what destroyed over-the-air radio in, in the United States. And it just kind of got a sad, depressing, kind of gave up on it. Um, I did have another, I did have one more job at another small radio station that was like, at that time, like one of the last few mom-and-pop-owned radio stations, which was kind of fun, but again, it proved that there was like not even enough money in it to basically 
you know, um, you know, pay yourself a livable salary. So, um, along the time while this was happening, my dad being an, an engineer, a computer engineer guy from, you know, early computer mainframe days and stuff, he was running his own business out of our home for like, you know, from the seventies on. And, uh, there were always computers around. So I learned a lot about computer technology and, uh, I started doing a few things like trying to write some or I did write some software for the Apple II computer to do things like manage playlists at the radio station and stuff. Nothing, it was, it was clunky and not very good, but you know, it, it, you know, just sort of like, it got me kind of interested in that side of things. And then, um, when the Macintosh came out and the first desktop publishing started, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And, um, so I started getting into that. I realized there was, you know, you could make more money in that being a desktop publishing consultant. And along the same time, like right after that started happening, the internet started to rear its head. And uh, again, because my dad had, you know, business in the computer technology area, you know, we were able to get an internet connection very early on. Like in, uh, I think we had an internet connection like 1987 at his company. And, uh, so like, then we had like Usenet and all these like distributed bulletin boards and stuff like that. I got involved writing some software to work with that. Um, uh, and then this, I, 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 I just, I just was really intrigued with it. Like using the, this new internet medium as a communications platform and all the different things you could do with it. So that was cool. That was fun. And then it wasn't until the internet started taking off a little bit bigger that I really started to see the potential there. So uh, without going into too much detail in between there, I basically found like, hey, I know enough. When you know, Once the web took off, I'm like, I know enough how to build web pages for all these different companies. And I know a lot about the TV and radio industries. So I started acting as a consultant and getting jobs to do websites for TV and radio stations. Um, and that was really a nice stepping stone to where I am right now because it gave me an opportunity to play around with things like really early streaming software. So, um, I was managing, uh, the local CBS affiliates or I guess CBS is owned station here in San Francisco doing their early web stuff. And, uh, we heard about real audio coming out and the, um, the engineering director of the station was also very intrigued in that. And he said like, Hey, Rusty, if I buy this software, can you set it up? Because it was like a thousand dollars to buy the streaming software. A lot of money at the time it seemed, but we got it and set it up and started putting up all these recordings. They got, they were fairly popular. Um, it still was like the audio quality was horrible. You know, it sounded like a distant AM radio station garbled or a bad self call. Um, (laughs) But it was, it showed that there was, you know, this is going to get better. This is going to get better. And yeah. then, uh, you know, after a few years and, you know, I ended up working with a couple other companies and getting them, getting them into streaming early video and early audio stuff. Uh, it still wasn't that great, but at one point in time, I think it was, uh, probably like 98 or so that they came out with, I think it was like real audio G2 or G3 or something. And it actually sounded pretty good. And so the company I was working at at the time, um, they were launching a new um, cable TV channel uh, called Tech TV. And uh, I remember my manager was saying, uh, or I asked my manager, I said like, hey, since we're already, we have a commitment to buy all this bandwidth, this streaming bandwidth, and we're we're behind schedule on launching, and we're not going to launch for three weeks. Do you mind if I just start like putting some music programming on it and telling people about it. And so then we can get a feel for how well it's being used and, you know, how well it's working. And they're like, Oh yeah, that's cool. Do that. Uh, so that was kind of like the precursor to some FM right there because I'd been, you know, parallel to all this stuff going on. I've been collecting lots of music. I've always, you know, I've always had a huge record collection. And, um, so like it was really easy for me to get together a bunch of interesting and different music to put on this test stream. I'm trying to remember what happened after that. So we did that for a while. That was cool. Then the station launched and it had to take over, you know, then all the bandwidth had to go back to their own programming. That's fine. 
Uh, later on, I was working at another tech startup, and we heard about uh, Shoutcast coming out, this new streaming audio protocol. And this company had lots of servers and stuff we were setting up for this project we were going to do there. And I worked with a couple people who always were, you know, like they looked at me as like, you know, when they were having a party, I was one of the DJs for their parties and they, everybody liked the music I was playing. And so they were like, hey, you should set, set up this so everybody can listen to, you know, the music, you know, in different different parts of the office here. And I set that up and it was, you know, the first incarnation was only, you know, 56K. It didn't sound very good. It sounded okay, but it didn't sound great. And uh, I remember, but the protocol supported some other stuff. So I like hunted around. I found you could actually get like a 128K MP3 encoder. That sounded quite good at the time, you know, it sound, you know. And, uh, and that was a real exciting thing to do. And you putting the stuff together and you're like, wow, this sounds really good. This sounds as good as an FM radio station. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I said, we had the same thing there. Like we weren't, we were launching a product and expecting tons of traffic. So we contracted to have lots of bandwidth and the product launch was delayed a few months. And so I said like, Hey, uh, in the meantime, since we just were paying for this bandwidth, can I, tell more people about it and spread the word about this, this channel. And, uh, uh, and they said, yeah, sure. Go for it. And, uh, it started taking off. And, uh, luckily like around the time we were launching it, the people who actually run Shoutcast, they were, um, offering, um, bandwidth to, to interesting radio stations. Like if you could demonstrate you had enough traffic, they would give you a, a free repeater that would give you the access to like, I don't know, it was like 500 or a thousand potential concurrent listeners. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then once that happened, then it could really spread the word and, and, uh, grew salad really took off and became one of the, you know, top five, top 10 shoutcast stations from like, this was 99 before we branded as some FM. So this is like late 99 to early 2000. Yeah. And just really shot up there. And then, uh, there were three channels that I was doing all together. It was Drone Zone, Groove Salad, and Secret Agent. Mm-hmm. Okay. They still exist and, today. <laughs> uh, and they still exist today. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, uh, and that's kind of how it, and basically once I realized like, huh, I really, I've got a radio network here. I should give it a name. Mm-hmm. And Soma FM came to mind because my, uh, my consulting company was called Soma Net. So um, Soma.net, the, Soma.net, the consulting company, was named that after the South of Market District of San Francisco, which is an area where I lived in where all the tech stuff was. And, um, and then I remember reading Brave New World and how Soma was the drug that everybody took while they danced to the electric music machine. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, that's, that's really good for a radio station. So cool. So so it, it, I loved that it had both things. It was playing up Soma for South Market here in San Francisco where we were, but also the the whole we're dancing to the electric music machine or the electronic music machine. I can't remember exact details, but uh, um, it just seemed it seemed perfect. So named it that, branded that. Um, the kind of iconic picture of the DJ in the front of the window was actually taken at a launch party for the company I was working at at the time where uh, we put together a little you know, a couple of DJs and stuff to do stuff. Mm-hmm. There's still debate of who the person is in the picture. It's not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's, there's two, uh, the two other DJs that were do- spinning that evening, both claim it was them, but I think it was a third DJ who we're not even, we can't even remember who it was. Mm-hmm. Anyway, since it's just a silhouette, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> But it's that's so interesting because I I usually don't write down many questions um, before I I do um, an interview with someone on our podcast. But um, I wrote some questions down, and um, it's so cool that you just answered like <laughs> so many of them, like with Soma <laughs> FM. Where does the name come from? Is it connected to Brave New World? What's the picture yeah, of Soma yeah. FM? All those questions I had for like the, maybe the last twenty years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they finally answered. That's so cool. Yeah, sorry, and then um, continue. What ha- what happened next? um just after that there was uh you know there was ups and downs to things like you know suddenly like realizing how much we're gonna have to pay in music royalties that were like retroactive back for five years and we almost went off the air because of that but 
after a lot of, you know, that's where I learned to like lobby with politics and uh, got together with a bunch of other small webcasters and little independents and stuff. And, uh, you know, we got the, uh, uh, I think it was, it was mostly driven by the religious broadcasters actually, because they were very well organized and they're like, we can't afford these crazy rates. You have to have a, a, uh, a carve out for smaller broadcasters who have smaller audiences that, you know, aren't all commercial driven, et cetera. And so that happened that, you know, that was, a, there was, that was, uh, I think it was, uh, 2002. It was pretty, uh, it was a pretty harrowing time because we thought we may not be able to continue to broadcast some FM. Um, yeah, but after that, like, you know, added some more channels, a couple other DJs I know uh, said like, hey, how can I do a channel? And so I helped set them up to do some stuff on some FM, um, like Indie Pop Rocks, uh, is, uh, Elise Nordling, who's a, a longtime uh, friend and collaborator of mine. She uh, she had this amazing indie music collection, and so we kind of turned that into Indie Pop Rocks. Ironically, she works for Spotify now, but she also has, she also works, she still works part-time for Soma FM. Um, uh, and then, um, oh, let's see who else, uh, there's a handful of other people involved, uh, you know, over the years doing um, different stations on Soma FM. Um, but yeah, just continue to like, you know, I've always, as I said, I've always collected music and anytime I've gotten to a point collecting music where I would put together like a playlist as a base music library for uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like I had a lot of uh, groove salad type music, but it uh, had vocals in it. And I realized like the kind I liked with the vocals in it, there it was almost all female vocals. And that's kind of how our Lush channel was born um, because people, you know, Groove Salad is mostly instrumental. In the old days, it had a little more vocals than it has now. Um, and even the vocals it has now, they're usually like, they're not like songs, they're not like stories, they're not like things that engage you, they're just sort of words. Um, and we moved like all the all the songs that were more traditional songs over to, uh, to Lush. And, uh, you know, there was also like I had a whole bunch of ambient songs that were a little too fast or had something rhythmic going in them and wouldn't fit on Drone Zone. And that's how Deep Space One was born. And uh, uh, yeah, so it's like just after I'd like, you know, delve into certain types of music and you find all this stuff, but then you find a lot of stuff that doesn't quite fit the format, but it's interesting on its own. So I like would categorize that, put that on a playlist and Every so often I'd look and I'd see like, wow, I've gotten like 400, 500 tracks now for that sort of style of music. Maybe it's time to focus on turning that into a new channel. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that led us from growing from, you know, the three stations we started with to the, I, I don't know the exact number, 30 some odd that we have right now. Yeah. And um, who, who picked the names for the stations? Like when you say Lush and Groove Salad and, you know, it somehow makes sense uh, if you listen to it for a while. But like, uh, how do you come up with Vapor, vapor Waves and uh, uh, so, uh, Space Station Soma <laughs> and other things? Yeah, you know, um, so um, Mary McDonald, who does our graphic design, my wife now, we, mm -hmm. we first started, she, she, we were just dating when we started, when we started working together on some FM. Um, she does almost all the artwork uh, and the artwork she doesn't do. She sort of gives uh, editorial direction to um, like, there's a couple illustrators we work with and, you know, like I'll vet some really uh, random ideas. Like, you know, for our Christmas channel, like I'm just thinking like, it's like a DJ Santa Claus. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then uh, she'll say something or like Santa Claus holding a, a vinyl record or something like this and they think oh yeah that sounds good <laughs> and then well you know then that one got you know given to our uh uh josh ellingson who's done a, some of the he does the non-photographic looking illustration stuff so he did like click hop and suburbs of goa and uh illinois street lounge and uh i'm trying to think heavyweight reggae um so basically, like, then Marin and I will hand off to him, like, this rough idea, and then he comes back with a couple things, and then she picks the one she likes the most. Um, he did the Vapor Waves logo, too. But how do we come up with those names? I don't know. We just throw, 
throw names back and forth a lot and say like, you know, what, what if we call it this? What if we call it that? And, uh, um, like when we named digitalis, we were going for this kind of, it was a, it was a channel that was inspired by, um, we started going to this music festival called Iceland airwaves. And there was a lot of bands at that show that did this kind of like hybrid rock electronic music. And it was all very more like mellow. It wasn't like, it wasn't dancey music. It was, um, more, this more chilled out music, but it was like a mix of electronic instruments and, and more traditional rock music instruments, you know, guitars and, and drums. And so we were, we were trying to think of like, what were we going to call that? And I said like, you know, something like with digital in the name of it, because, you know, we're talking about like, you know, it's like an analog rock and roll with, with digital stuff added to it. And so we go back and forth. I think what's the tagline we came up with, like digitally affected analog rock to calm the agitated heart. And that calm the agitated heart was comes from the, the digitalis flower uh, is actually a drug they use. They, they, they create a drug from it from, I guess they, the oil from the seeds or something. I don't know, but uh, uh, that is actually used to treat certain type of heart ailments. Mm-hmm. And Marin was like researching some stuff on that and, and it's like, Oh yeah, that's perfect. And uh, so then she drew a bunch of digitalis flowers coming out of guitar and that ended up being its logo. Okay. And um, so you also have a um, station called um, uh, a channel called uh, Covers, which I found very interesting yeah. because um, you can finally listen to pop music again and enjoying it <laughs> a lot, <laughs> uh, which <laughs> makes it very great. Um, and also, like that, ca- makes me come to the next question, which is, how do you actually find the music? Because it's the, the music you have on your channels is like is sometimes so unique. Yeah. So how do you find it? Hmm. It's a little hard to say because it's changed drastically over the years. I mean, be you know, in the very early days of some FM, well, I should say the pre days of some FM, it was all you know spent in record stores, flopping through albums and looking for different stuff, and you know, looking for clues like if you might if it might be a good CD by who produced it or. With a lot of the electronic stuff that came out in the 90s, you could pretty much look at the label and know what kind of, you know, different record labels. They are always would pretty much release the same kind of music. So often if you liked something that label released, you'd like some other things that you hadn't heard that they'd release. Um, so that is how I originally did it. Then like around the 2000s in the Napster area, Uh, or Napster period, I should say, uh, that became a good tool for finding stuff. Although the quality of things on Napster was, you know, often questionable, but it was a great way to like sample a ton of stuff before you could sample things. Um, you know, like you heard, you'd, you'd hear like, Oh, what about this artist? I like that one song they did, but they've got four albums. I wonder how much other good stuff is there. And so you just download them all and listen to it. And if I found the album that had good tracks on it, at that point, I would go and buy the CD. Um, nowadays, we just buy digital tracks. Um, but, you know, like, there's there's a couple different ways to find music. Like, I, I used to use allmusic.com as a good resource because it was really interesting to see, like, what writers, what producers, what different people worked on the albums and if you liked some stuff that those same people had worked on, you probably would like the other stuff they worked on. So that was a good way to discover new music. Um, you know, at a point in time, uh, Amazon's recommendations were a good starting point. Like, you know, people who bought this CD also bought this one. Mm-hmm. You had to take a lot of risk back then, right? Because you didn't have a way to hear it. Although sometimes you could say like, oh, people who bought this, bought this one, and then go find that one on, on Napster or, you know, a similar service. And uh, listen to it and say, oh, yeah, that's good. Let's get that CD. Um, nowadays, I mean, some FM has gotten to the point where it's got enough of a reputation. A ton of people send us music, and uh, which is kind of a blessing in disguise because there's so much music I have to listen to. And, and you know, frankly, you know, frankly, you know, like at least half of it is bad and, you know, another large chunk of it is not really appropriate to any of our channels. And, you know, 
but you got to hunt through that to find the good things. And um, unfortunately for me, there so many times there's someone will send me an album of 10 tracks and there'll be one good track on it and the rest are not good at all. You can kind of almost like imagine their whole career. Like they've, these are the songs I've been working on for the last three years. And like, you know, the, the one that's really good might be the very last song they actually recorded. And you can sort of see them getting better as they make the songs in the album, but it takes a while to, you know, it's, it's hard to go and listen to all that stuff. And you can't just, I mean, you can sometimes listen for just like 10 seconds and say like, Oh yeah, no, that doesn't work at all. But other times you have to listen to it for quite a while. And then really what I end up doing is I don't add a, add something to some FM for the most part, unless I've heard the song two or more times. So I'll sometimes go through and take a quick pass at things, just kind of playing in the background, not really paying attention to them. Then I'll go start and I, you know, we call it needle dropping where you play like 30 seconds from the middle of the song and then see like which one of those grabbed me, which means like the first time I played it, it sort of stuck in my unconscious. And now I hear, I go, Oh yeah, that's good. That's good. And then, you know, to the other fact, sometimes you'll hear a song and the second time you hear it, you'll like, Ooh, it's so annoying. You know, I'm not, I'm certainly not going to play that song. Um, so, you know, these days, uh, you know, I also get a lot of, I get a lot of recommendations from other musicians of like, Hey, my friend did this album that I really like, and you're playing my music on Groove Salad or Drone Zone or whatever. And I think his might fit as well. Can you give it a listen? So that's a good way to find stuff now. Okay. Um, and, you know, also with the streaming services, with Apple Music and Spotify, it's so easy to go through and just sample a ton of different things. Like you might hear something that sounded interesting and you go, you know, click on it. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. And then it gives you some other recommendations, which are usually horrible. But I find that like on, on Spotify, about one out of 10 recommendations they give me is actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the and algorithm so, like, just, sometimes helps, yeah. You know, I I find their algorithms are, you know, Apple Music and Spotify both, their algorithms are very different, but they also are just, they, if I was only using that, they'd fail all the time for me. But as far as discovery goes, they help me narrow things down, right? Because they're cutting out, they're helping me like, oh, maybe one of these five or maybe one of these 10 would be good. And you listen to them. Oh yeah. You find like two good tracks. Yeah. And, uh. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of the process yeah just, um, i realized this as well like when uh like a while ago and i listened to different music on spotify and um but then in the nighttime i, w- I usually played like um some sleep music or something like this but then mm-hmm. the algorithm started to change and um it recommended me like all sorts of sleep music and i'm like ah oh, well <laughs> during the day i'm not really into sleep music so that doesn't really yeah, help like discovering new music <laughs> so, you can actually imagine my my problems that i have with spotify on the recommendations yeah. they give me unless their recommendations only work good the way i found to make it work is i, I start creating a playlist on spotify and then it will give me recommendations for that playlist rather yeah. than my overall music listening. Yeah. But helps. when I just turn on when I just turn on Spotify and it gives me some recommendations, they're horrible because they're like, <laughs> no, I was taking a deep dive into this genre of music to see if there was something we wanted to make a channel of. But it turns out, like, I really don't like that genre of music. I only <laughs> like, like, two songs out of the 50 I listen to. And it's like, oh, but you listen to these 50 songs, so you must like it. No. There's a there's a song I heard on Groove Salad, um, which is from Dobie, and it's called Way Over, and it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I did some research to find out more about uh, the artist, and it's I think it's like a hip hop artist from from the UK. And the, the only um, place I could find the music was on on YouTube um, and Bandcamp. So like, so how did you find something like this? Wait, like, which track was that? Way Over. Yeah, Way Over from or... Dobie. D O B I. Yeah, wait, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh yeah, that, um, because the I rest of that came yeah. off of a, yeah, that's something I ripped myself, so that came off a CD, mm-hmm. that came off a CD, and, um, gosh, where did I find that, AM Eternal 3, AM Eternal, where was that released by, I think that might have been a compilation, because the, the rest of the music for, like, that I, I like listened to from from Doby, because I thought, oh, there must be more. I think it was like some some hip hop and rap that I'm not so much into. So um, I was like, yeah. how did this end up on the station? Like, how how can you find something like this? This is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> well, I'll um, that was on a compilation. 
it was on a compilation called 3 a.m eternal mm -hmm. and uh i think it was a german compilation actually oh, okay. um <laughs> and and that's sort of that's how i'd like discover the artist but then i like i do the same thing you do i go what else do these people do mm -hmm. and sometimes you're you find all sorts of great music then other times you find that one song was a uh, was out of character it was like a fluke for them and it might have just been the sort of thing where that was a song they were collaborating with someone else on and not like you know what they normally do and there's so many artists i play like on groove salad that most of the other songs they they make are nothing like groove salad mm -hmm. and it's even that's true for a lot of the other channels as well too there's a there's a lot of artists out there that don't focus on a specific style they just do a bunch of different things and then if you you know you like one of those tracks and you listen to the other stuff they do it doesn't sound anything like that track it's not even in the same you know vague genre yeah and it's uh, i also experience um listening to the station stays um it it has it has ex like it it goes through a, a certain genre or like a th through a, like it has like a straight line and then there's like this particular like one song that's a little bit outside but you can still use it you know like for example this one it's like very instrumental and very like mm -hmm. like more classical but it fits perfectly mm -hmm. into the other into the rest of of the mm -hmm. of the sound do you have like a did you program like an algorithm in the playlist to do such things or does it just happen randomly i put i put stuff into uh different categories and i'll play different categories of stuff clump together or spread out it, it all kind of depends on the channel different channels work a little differently mm -hmm. um so yeah i i've got a tool that um helps me schedule the music uh and that will do things like you know it, it basically lets me put all these different criteria like okay for today's playlist i need to come up with 24 hours of music i don't want to play any songs that i played in the last 48 hours um I also don't want to, you know, like, I only want to play one out of every four songs that is in this, you know, that I put this tag on or this, um, uh, I do things like I, I rate the songs to, uh, help me set a rotation for them. So certain songs that I like to hear a lot will, you know, I'll put a higher rating on, on my internal system. And so that tells my scheduling program to play that one more frequently. Um, It's not a it's not a random mix at all. Although there's a random factor thrown in there just to, you know, uh, you know, given all things are equal on something, it won't do them. It won't do it the same way twice, right? Um, but you know, that's like you know, I think like you know, typically the randomness adds like 10 to 20 percent to the weighting of the way the schedule would be put together. Um, but yeah, and I do I try to do things like not play songs at the same time I played them in the last couple of days and certain channels where there's a uh, bigger playlist, that's really not a problem. Um, but it's funny that if you do, you know, like if I tell my scheduling tool, like uh, I don't want to include in this playlist, any songs that I played in the last uh, 48 hours. Well, it will tend to schedule the first one as something that was played 48 hours and two minutes ago. And so I like to do things like make sure that the songs are not played at the same time every day. And I spread them out so it sort of it tracks that information as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of you know how I put the things together. And then I usually go in and tweak a few things by hand or move some stuff, some things around. Especially like um, I don't know if if uh, you know if if something like is you know in the in the zeitgeist or there's like something happening like you hear lots of people talking about on Twitter and think oh we have a song that would fit that really well you know I'll, I'll go even if i played it like yesterday i'll go play it again um and a lot of times like you know just uh i don't get tons of email from listeners about you know, like you know making song requests and stuff um but sometimes i do and uh and if i think like you know they request a certain song I go, oh, you know especially if it's like a newer song i've added and i played it like yesterday and someone's requesting it again today i'm like oh well That means some people really like it, so I'm going to play it, you know, again. Even though I typically wouldn't play something, so you know, I groove salad. The whole idea about groove salad is you're going to hear about, you know, I, tr you know, you basically can listen all week and hopefully not hear repeats, unless yeah. it's some new song that everybody loves and everybody wants to hear a lot of. You know, like Tycho's very popular on groove salad, and 
when a new Tycho album comes out, yeah, <laughs> people expect to hear a lot of the new tracks, right? Yeah. So I will play them more. I'll, you know, sometimes I'll play a track twice a day, but it's rarely more than once a day on Groove Salad. And it's also, um, I mean, the other stations like Fluid, I found very, yeah. very interesting, especially like this this particular sound of like, oh, it's it's very hard to de describe, but it's like, uh, it sounds very like it, was, it uses synthesizers, like the, the vocals are, um, use vocalizers and, you know, like... Or you, vocoder? You, vocoders, yeah, sorry, <laughs> vocoders. Yeah. And you, you can really hear that it's... Um, it's The, it's very modern music, but um, like it's it's still like a let's say like a traditional up building up of of the songs. So like they have like yeah, the, the yeah. flowers and stuff. So it's uh, so chords, uh, choruses, very, and yeah. very standard. You know, like traditional st song structures, but with mm -hmm. uh, you know more electronic sounds in them. Yeah, yeah. And the, the beats are great. It's for us. It's perfect. Like we usually wake up with fluid. It's uh, <laughs> it makes the day more fluid. <laughs> so that's what yeah, you usually yeah, say. Yeah. Um, and yeah. also, um, like um, uh, for Crew Salad, I have to say that what I found very interesting is that you can hear it all the time. Like there's, it, you can listen to it to chill out. But I also have it playing when I have friends over and you have a few drinks or whatever, you know. So it's it's always um, it's always suitable for the moment um and a friend of mine told me that they have uh crew cell at 24 7 running um on a separate computer in their offices i see <laughs> i see that in our logs all the time like i'll go and look and i'll find like you know there's like 50 people that have been listening for more than 20 hours <laughs> yes. and uh he actually and wanted they're me to not yeah. bots they're actually people yeah Yeah, he wanted um, me to ask you if, if, if you can see that, and uh, now you answer yeah. the questions. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, you know, it hasn't been an issue as much lately, but sometimes when we're getting way too much traffic, um, you know, if there had been like a magazine article or something that featured us, what I'll do is I'll go in there and I'll uh, we'll go and kick off people that have been on for more than I think like 16 hours or something, because that seems, you know, if they're still listening, they can go plus, you know, re reconnect right. and play yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. And if they're not, you know. And a lot of times we have we see where you can tell that someone's obviously fallen asleep, or <laughs> not in in the past it was like where people would be listening to it at work and then go home and leave their computer on and forgot to, to stop the channel. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, you know we see that, and we'll sometimes like kick the person off, and but not like <laughs> ban them or anything. They can yeah, just yeah, of course. click click play to come right, come right back. It seems like it's a little better to do that than. Some of the other stations uh, do things like after you've been listening for an hour, they'll they'll say like, "Hey, are you still there? Click play to continue." Hmm. It's like that's annoying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's definitely annoying. And I'm also um, you said earlier you uh, you don't want to be like in this advertisement business too much. Um, yeah, and that's why you nearly decided not to go further in this direction of radio and everything. But um, now it turned out that you have your own radio station and um, it's running without advertisement. It's running based on donations. So how mm -hmm. do you find this? Is it very challenging? Or is there different times and different times of the years or different times in general where like people are more generous or and then other times? Or? It, it Basically, there's times when I have to, I, I say I have to beg people more during certain times and other times I don't have to beg nearly as much. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we now do some things like uh, a year after someone's donated, uh, a message goes out uh, saying like, hey, we hope you enjoyed it over the last year. If you're still listening, why don't you make another donation, which is great. And that uh, when we didn't start doing that until probably like 10 or 12 years ago. And once I started doing that, it was, it was really great. I didn't, I didn't have to, we didn't have to put all these big messages on the front page or run as many announcements about, we need your money, please donate now. Um, because a lot of the people who listen to us have been listening to us. They're more than happy and they're, you know, you know, they like it when we remind them. And, and quite honestly, the, the, you know, they have an option to say like, don't ever contact me again. And the percentage of people that do that is, is so, you know, it's like less than 5%, um, which is, I think, really, really great. It shows yeah. like we have a very dedicated, supportive audience. And 100%, I got to yeah. say, I, I love our audience. Our audience, you know, I can't imagine having a better audience. 
No, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, yeah, I also I will uh, donate a hundred dollars after our interview. <laughs> and I also want to encourage everyone listening listening right now. They please check out Soma FM. It's been a like a great part of my life, and I really want everyone to join in. It's 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 really like you, you guys like the music or Thanks. that you pick and choose for all, all different stations for all different moods. Even if you can listen to Crew Salad all the time, but there's so many other. Um, stations which are really really good and um, I encourage everyone to go online and check out Soma FM and check it out. And I'm glad so you like Fluid because it's one of our newer channels and uh, I, it's not quite as popular as I would hoped yet but it continues every month its numbers go up a little bit so yeah, uh, it's one of my uh, my other favorite channels. It is really good. <laughs> like Fluid, um, I have automations on um, our home pods here in, in our apartment. Um, and it's on different times, it plays different stations. So with Sunset as Groove Salad, um, in the morning it's Fluid. Um, then for my meditation, I have Drone Zone. <laughs> There's like all sorts of things like yeah. all over the day. Yeah. <laughs> so where do you see um, Soma FM going in the next few years? Like what do you oh, think is going to happen? One unfortunate thing that's been happening is the music royalty rates continue to go up and up and up. And um, so that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, like even just last year, our rates went up about, well, I think they increased like $50,000 a year. Um, and every couple of years, the rates get adjusted. So they just did a big adjustment of all there's like four four or five different people we pay royalties to and uh so that's that's the the main challenge for me because otherwise we're at a pretty sustainable level uh you know we we make enough money to keep things going keep improving things keeping our equipment maintained and upgraded you know buying more music you know all that sort of stuff um but you know as the as the uh as the royalties keep going up it uh you know it cuts into our um, our, uh, what I want to say, our use, the rest of the budget we can, uh, afford to do other things with. And there's a lot of people ask like, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? It's like, well, we don't have the resources to do that. For example, like we don't have a, uh, a dedicated Sonos application. And, um, that's because, well, two things, you can still get us on Sonos by going through TuneIn, but to develop a Sonos app, it gets, you know, we're not the experts on that internally uh you know we have a software development team of there's some part-time contractors who work on all our apps and stuff but it's something that's not in their expertise so i'd have to find someone new and you know it's gonna you know to do something like that it'd cost twenty thousand dollars probably to get it all you know after all was said and done i know somebody who's listening is probably saying like oh you could do it for only a couple thousand dollars and mm. but uh uh if, if that's the case contact me and we'll talk about it yeah. uh, <laughs> um but, you know, it would be nice to have a little more money to spend on doing some of these other things. Like, you know, uh, Apple keeps threatening to open up the home pods to running native apps on them. They haven't done that yet. Like to listen to us, you still have to, you're still in, basically going through tune in. Um, and, uh, it would be great if we had our own one on there that could do things where you could even ask it, like what song is playing right now. And, um, or, you know, tell some FM, I love this song, tell some FM, I hate this song. Um, I don't know if you've seen like in our in our iOS and our um in in our Mac apps we have the little the love or the WTF buttons and yeah. those don't feed an algorithm but they do generate every week we send a report on that back to the individual music directors for the channel so you can see like what listeners are liking and what they're not liking. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. And uh and where it's mostly useful to me uh I know there's a lot of times like there's songs I love and you know I'll see like three people hated it. I'm like, oh, "Sorry." You'll have to listen to it. <laughs> just deal with it. But uh, but usually what how it works for me is there's certain songs I add because I think, yeah, that's okay. Maybe you know, maybe it'll grow on me and I'll just add the song. But then I see a bunch of people didn't like it and I'll go and give it another listen. I'm like, yeah, it's not that good. Okay. And so I'll, I'll remove it and, you know, I'll just make a note, you know, you know, put this in the reject pile. Um, so, you know, we use that for stats, but, it, you know, it's not, an, it's not an algorithm in as much as it's just giving a person feedback and then letting us decide what to do based on that feedback. Okay. And um, the, the music industry in general, I saw like um, an interview, uh, I read an interview with you from uh, some time ago, and you were talking about uh, 
uh, telecom. They're like they're doing like a streaming services, and you uh, weren't very happy with this, um, like what they did there. Um, what do you think in general of streaming services, and do you think this is, um, a, you know, a good way to share music with the world, or do you think it just cuts off like the a smaller music production, you know, and uh, and gives like the popular people, um, you know, more money? Well, you know, I I'm a huge fan of Bandcamp.com. If yeah. you're familiar with that, yeah, yeah, and that's also been that's been a huge source uh, in the last like five years or so. That's become like a dominant place where we get music now. Um, it's great because it's sort of somewhere in between, like you know, buying a digital file and having a, a streaming service because you can stream it, stream the whole album there if you want, and if you like it, you can buy it. And then you know. Um, so that I like that a lot, and I think musicians like that, especially indie musicians, because the real what I call an indie musician is not what the commercial music industry calls an indie musician. Uh, what I call an indie musician is someone who's like recording stuff in their bedroom, they're releasing stuff directly. Um, those are sometimes if you're very successful at doing that, the commercial music industry refers to you as like an emerging artist. An indie artist is someone they will release on one of their sub labels and doesn't make as much money and they're kind of, you know, they're going to subsidize their first album and, uh, you know, hope they make it big. That's a kind of really different way of thinking of what's an indie musician. Um, so Bandcamp is truly good for like, you know, the person who produces their own music, working at home or, you know, in, in a small recording studio someplace and doing almost everything themselves. And, um, because of that, you know, you if you you know you can sell a hundred albums on Bandcamp and you know make yourself like I think like five or six hundred bucks, and the cost of you know there's really nothing up front. Uh, they charge you to do that. You know they take a fifteen or twenty percent cut or something. That's about it. With a um, streaming service, you know, like you really got to get a decent number of plays to make real money off of it. Um, and you know I'm. That's the same thing with internet radio. I mean, even though we, you know, we pay, I, don't know, I think close to like a hundred thousand dollars a year in music royalties, mm -hmm. wow. um, because we play so many different artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you know, like yeah. by wow. the time they, you know, like they're if they're on a record label, their record label gets paid first, and their record label splits a cut with them, and you know, depending on how their contract is set up, et cetera. Um, you know. They're not going to make much at all from us. They're going to make way more by selling music directly to fans on Bandcamp. And they tell us that. They're like, they want us to get like the attention and then, you know, or to expose people. So we're being used for promotional purposes by the artist when they, you know, when they're being played on some FM. But they, and they're not making, they're not trying to make their money from airplay exposure. They want to get the stuff sold on Bandcamp where they can make some significant money. And, uh, you know, if you're a more established artist and you have a large catalog of work and you've got a pretty good audience, then you can make some decent money with services like uh, Apple Music and Spotify. But uh, I still, I, you know, I'm, I'm a the Bandcamp model is something I really like a lot. I've always, um, I've always hoped that someone like Apple Music or Spotify will get into doing a thing where you could pay, you know five or ten dollars to have pre-release access to an album and all that money would flow to the artist and then you get that for like 30 or 60 days before it rolls out to the general public i think that'd be a great way for uh there to be support you know like basically good support to the artist because if you like an artist you're happy to give them some money um i mean if you know most people and there's exceptions you know there's people who don't have any money and can't give it to them anyway and but, but you know most like people who love yeah, if you love the artist, you want to support them. Yeah. And um, who is Big Earl? <laughs> ah. <laughs> Big Earl is a mid-1990s AT&T Bell Labs speech synthesizer demo. Okay. <laughs> that was a early, early internet speech synthesizer demo. Um And uh, it was there was like about 40 different voices it had. And then you could set all these different attributes. And I was playing around with it. And I came up with something. There was a preset called uh, 
big man, and then you could adjust the speed and a few other things about the phrasing of it. And I came up with something, oh, that sounds great. I really like it. And then so I, I wrote, basically wrote a script where I would give it, I'd give this program a big long list of things it would say, and it would upload them to this website, uh, you know, put that text into the website, get the downloaded file, which was in some really weird format, convert it to a wave or an MP3, and then, you know, add the title and information on it. So like basically I had this whole little batch process that would hit this, uh, this website. And the problem was, I guess I got carried away sometimes like, I went through, I was going to try to have Big Earl do uh, time and day announcements. So, you know, I had this, you know, it's, it's 647 or it's 647 <laughs> PM. And I, apparently I crashed the website when I ran that the first time. I, oh no, I killed Big Earl. No. And then like, a, then a few days later it, it was back and I fixed and, you know, I did some more, but it would crash all the time. And then eventually it just never ever came back and i was like oh no so luckily i hadn't recorded enough things of big earl speaking that i could edit together and get more stuff as i needed it but uh i did get a sort somebody tracked down this um the the history behind that speech synthesizer demo that was on the web and basically it was a uh it was a software engineer who'd worked at bell labs all his life and he was nearing retirement and he set up you know in this is like in 1996 he set up this this web demo of their speech thing and it ran on like a bell labs 3b2 computer that was sitting in his cubicle and um and then he retired and uh his cube mate would every now and then go over and see that the thing had crashed and would reset it and it would work again for a while and then uh and then his cube mate retired also and it kept running for a while, and then every now and then crash, and then somebody else from the building said, oh, the thing crashed, I'll go reset it. But what what happened at the very end was they moved that location, they closed that building and moved to a new one, and there was nobody to reset up the computer at the new location, so it was just a, kind of abandoned. And um, one of our listeners had tracked that down, actually found some people who had worked at Bell Labs and uh, asked about this speech, and that's how the story, you know, we got okay. that story together. All right. Thank you very much. That was probably way more than you wanted to know about Big Earl, wasn't no, it? No, no, that was fantastic. I loved it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was because I was always I heard this is Big Earl and, <laughs> yeah. and I, I was always wondering like why Big Earl and everything and now like you gave me the whole backstory. That's great. Um yeah. do you have time for a, a few more questions? Or like sure, a, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um I want that's just some basic things. I want to um want to know who are the the people behind um Soma FM because you already mentioned that your wife is um helping you out with the cover uh, the, the artwork and um yeah. there are other people having different stations. So who are those people? How did you find them? So um Elise Nordling who does uh indie pop rocks and who does uh folk forward. Um I've known her for a really long time. Uh, she's been a huge music fan, and we we're both, you know, we we we're both music fans together. Uh, she always liked slightly different music than I liked, and so we do a lot of comparing of notes. And uh, like she's like, oh, she'd say, oh, I found this artist I think you'll really like, and you know, I would do the same with her. Um, and then so um, so she's been working with me on some of my family like, since the beginning, and uh, you know, there's been you know certain there's been times like where she was doing way more work or way less work you know it's all it's again it's a part-time gig and she's worked at a bunch of other places but uh there, anytime like she's been out of a job uh i was like i'm like okay come to work at some fm for like you know four days a week okay and then uh she is her her day job now is she works in music licensing and um in royalty reporting and uh she's just really good with like knowing who all the artists are who all the labels are who are the contacts there She's just got like a, you know, a head for the, you know, the metadata behind all the music. And, uh, so, um, yeah, every time, you know, like whenever she's available to work, you know, more, you know, may, way more hours for some FM, a lot of our stuff gets way more organized, which is great. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, you know, she's been, she, you know, she was working at a, um, San Francisco music rights company that got bought by Spotify. That's how she ended up at Spotify right now. Uh, so she doesn't, you know, she, she only does, uh, programming, you know, music programming for some FM. Now she doesn't do any music royalty or anything like that. Let's see who else is involved. Uh, 
um, Kampf, who's a DJ that we first met when we started doing DEF CON radio, and it turns out we had a lot of a lot of musical taste in common, and uh, and he's responsible for a lot of the programming on about you know about half the programming on DEF CON radio. He's largely responsible for Fluid. Uh, Fluid came about with like I was telling him like oh, I really like songs like this and this that I knew he liked as well but they don't fit on Groove Salad or any of the other channels I'm like why don't we do a channel just for it he was like ah, I don't know I don't think there's enough music and <laughs> and but you know we can, there, I would find some more stuff and I said what about this what about this and then um, I, I think I, I got him a little more excited about putting it together and uh, yeah so now, now he you know he does 90% of the programming on Fluid, probably 95%. Every now and then I'll send him something. This would be great for Fluid. Half the time he writes back like, oh, yeah, I'm adding that next week. I already found that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and DEF CON, he also uh, has like this, um, don't forget your three, two, one. Uh, yes. Three uh -huh. hours of yes. sleep, He's, two, uh, two hot yes. meals, one shower. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so he's... Uh, he's uh, he, you know, he's, he's, he's great because he's... What's been nice is he did a college radio show called The Nerd Show for many, many years in uh, in the Salt Lake City, Utah area. And then his college uh, shut down their radio station for funding reasons or whatnot. So uh, he's uh, he's had a lot of, uh, you know, now he's some FM is like his main focused creative outlet, which is great. And it's it's he's really a pleasure to work with because we're similar enough but also different enough that we're always surprising each other with new stuff so you know it's that's great and then um roy bachelor uh who does our bootlicker channel um he's someone else i've worked with forever in fact in the early days when i was talking about doing all the things on the telephone lines and dial jokes and stuff he was one of the people doing one of those so i've known him for a tremendously long time and he had actually started bootlicker as an independent radio station Early or like in you know shortly after some FM, and uh, but then he got tired of running it and shut it down, and then he decided no I miss running it I'm going to start it back up again, and at that point I said like oh well you know use you can do it on the some FM servers now you don't have to pay some other company for that, and he's like oh cool, uh, and he really got into it for a while but you know Roy has a uh, he gets really excited about certain things for a while and then kind of. Uh, burns out on them uh, like a lot of a lot of really creative people are so I told him I said nope I'm not letting you shut it down this time I'm going to keep it going and he's like all right fine whatever and then six months later he's like he's like, okay I want to do this more again and I'm like, well, good thing we didn't shut it down so <laughs> so our kind of agreement is right now that uh, he if he loses interest in I kind of take the reins for a period of time just you know keep the playlist update and keep things going and uh, and then he'll uh, then when he gets in the mood for it, he comes back and uh, does a whole bunch of stuff for it. He's well connected in that scene, knows a lot of those artists. Go, you know, travels around, going to their shows and things. So, uh, you know, he's he's kind of perfect for that role. Uh, let's see who else. Um, Dion Garcia, who does Seven Inch Soul, he does our um, our uh, soul, our um, Jolly Old Soul Christmas Channel. He does the Heavyweight Reggae Channel right now. He's a local. Uh, uh, San Francisco DJ who does a lot of uh, he's really into collecting obscure weird 45 RPM records and he has these like meet these monthly meetups with other people where they come and they all they all uh, they all they all take turns like digitizing everybody's new super rare you know I spent $150 on this record at an auction kind of thing uh, and uh, yeah he's great um, Milkman who does the trip uh, the trip was originally started by a guy named Tag Loomis, who used to work for Shoutcast. And uh, and when AOL bought Shoutcast and started of, and Winamp and started shutting that down, um, uh, he asked me if he could bring it to some FM, and he did. And then he, I don't know, things were going on in his life, and he decided he was not going to have time to do radio anymore. And Milkman had been working with him for a very long time, helping him out, helping him with new music and stuff. And so Milkman took over. Um, who else? Sean Blosser, Beat Blender. Um, Sean was running Beat ben Blender independently. Uh, shortly after, I think we started some FM. Um, and uh, and then when we when the then he took it off the air. I think when uh, if I remember correctly, when the uh, uh, royalty stuff came down, like and everybody realized, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to pay. 
you know, it was going to be for like a small station, it was going to be like $10,000 a year. I'm like, oh, I don't have that kind of money. So uh, I said, uh, you know, we, he was helping me out with some technical things on some FM because he's a network or he was a network engineer at the time. And uh, uh, so we brought Beat Blender to some FM and because I always like Beat Blender was like, the, it's like a little too eclectic for what I play on Groove Salad. And it's a little more, it's often a little more up tempo. It does more four on the floor, kind of like deep house type stuff, which is not the kind of groove I want to have on Groove Salad. Groove Salad, I try to be like, whereas Beat Blender has a lot more like, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes um, sense. <laughs> so. Let's see. Um, oh gosh, who else? Uh, uh, Chris Bryant uh, does a lot of social media stuff for him for us. He's uh, I met him through this thing called the Ambient Music Conference that happened in Helsinki. God, it was about five or six years ago now. Um, he uh, he's a partner in a couple of uh, electronic music record labels as well. So he's really entrenched in the business. He knows so many of the artists. Yeah. You know, um, uh, and let's see who else. Uh, Michael K, who does our covers channel. Him and his. Uh, wife they're both collectors of obscure cover songs and uh she is it's they both work for um for industrial light and magic and uh, they're, so they're both in the film biz and uh um i've i've known them for a while too again and we we're always talking you know he's talking about like he's, he's uh, too bad you don't have a channel for for just covers because with this st- all the music that Lorelai and I have collected, you know, we, we could do something really crazy here. Yeah. It's so um, cool. Covers is such a and, great station. And I said, let's do it. Let's do it. And so, um, probably again, the problem I have with him, he's so busy with his day job now that, uh, I, you know, I have to you know, take the reins for some of the time, but he come, he comes, he's still collecting, right? He's always collecting the music. So, I'll have to run the thing for like two months and he'll come in and say like, okay, I got a whole bunch of new stuff. I'm going to start dropping this in and we're going to start adding this. And, you know, and, you know, he'll make a bunch of big changes and keep, you know, keep things going. So, um, a lot of the music directors I work with in some FM are people who wouldn't be able to do a radio channel full time themselves. And so like, I find, you know, I've found like the people that I like to work with are the ones that are like that, but also have similar taste in music to me. So, and, uh, you know, we can, we, we support each other in making a radio channel happen. I'm forgetting somebody. Who am I forgetting? Um, uh, I mean, there's a couple other folks that work with us. Not Nitya who does Sonic Universe. Uh, Mark Lunzel who does our metal channel. Um, Jason Drigg who helps out with Underground 80s. He also, for a while, he was, you know, he's done a bunch of other stuff around some FM over the years. Um, Again, always just you know part time. There's, I kind of joke that some FM has um, has two point one employees, whereas I'm one point five because I have to work so much. And then the other <laughs> like there's a, other uh, make a point six of an employee. <laughs> at the time they spend. <laughs> but um, and I mean that's the way we do it. We you know we have to be you know we don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of budget. Everybody has to do a lot of different things and yeah. And do you work from home, everyone, or do you do you like have a studio where you meet and do? Uh, yes and can... yes. So okay. we have we have an office studio. Uh, we use it to meet up. We use it to do. You know, we've got a couple of Pro Tools stations there, and lots of microphones and some, some synthesizers and other stuff for when we want to do station IDs and background music. And, um, and it's also kind of like our business office, and where all the merchandise and the T-shirts and mugs and stuff come out of. Uh, most of the DJs work remotely. Well, actually all of the DJs work remotely most of the time. Um, the office studio we have set up is usually just for like live re- events or recording special programs or, uh, we were doing a bunch of podcasts for a while out of there, but COVID kind of got in the way of that. Yeah. So yes and yes is the answer to that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, I'm so grateful for your time, but I also don't want you um, don't, to hold you much longer. <laughs> I, don't, I, have, I don't um, want to bore the listeners. <laughs> no, you don't at all. Like, I mean, you don't bore me at all. I, I, could, I, I would have like a thousand more questions. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, um, I, I want to ask you two more things, uh, which, okay. I, which I ask every, um, every guest we have on, on our podcast. And the first one is because we are called unpopular people. 
what would you do differently if you were popular? <sighs> hmm. I kind of like uh, staying in the background. Um, there was a period when we were doing all the um, the royalty legislation stuff, the lobbying for it, and you know, going back and meeting with Congress and trying to work on behalf of all these other broadcasters. And because of that, I was getting a lot of attention, and you know, I was being reported in the media and whatnot. And it was not a fun thing because you couldn't say anything without pissing somebody off. Somebody, you know, like. Um, you know, a lot of indie broadcasters were saying like, oh, you're going to sell us out, you know, because I had said something like, I think royalties should be reasonably priced. And they were like, we shouldn't have to pay any royalties at all. And I'm like, okay, all right, great. You can't, you know, it was just a, not a good position to be in. So like I, uh, if I would, what would I do if I was popular? I'd be trying to be more anonymous. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. And um, the other question is that we usually ask uh, or that we always ask because um, the best things thing to change something and we talked about this earlier when we talked about the weather and the global warming or like mm -hmm. different temperatures or whatever you want mm -hmm. to call it. Um, so the best way to change things is with education. So if you could have an impact on the education system in the US or anywhere else in the world, uh, what do you think the schools are missing? Oh, that's a that's a complicated question. Um, it could be anything. It could be from yeah. Like so I think I think what I would say is I think uh, especially these days schools need to teach more um, learning, knowing how to properly research something, because the internet's made it so easy to do research that a lot of the research we turn up is completely wrong. Um, Because you know you just look at the first few search headings. You didn't have a detailed enough search. You know you're not asking the question like who is actually writing this thing, which I'm basing my you know the research I'm doing on. Um, so I think I would uh, I would encourage the schools to teach people how it's almost like a library science, information science kind of thing to learn how to do research properly and to vet the sources of that information to make sure that you're getting proper information and not propaganda mm -hmm. and um i just came up with one one more question but it will be quick <laughs> hopefully because <laughs> i want i want to always wanted to know what was the very first song you streamed on Groove salad oh do you remember remember still out <laughs> you know because there were so many like false starts and trials i'll tell you the i'll i can give you a an answer that's a little more accurate How about the artist that inspired Groove Salad? Yes, please. And that would be a an artist named, or a band called Fila Brazilla, uh, which is mostly a duo of Steve Cobby and Dave McSherry. And Steve Cobby, Steve Cobby is still uh, releasing new stuff all the time. He's always sending me his latest releases. Uh, I don't play it all, but I play a lot of it. And... Uh, And I got his, you know, like his, his, uh, his music really inspired the creation of Groove Salad. Okay. Can you spell the, the name of this artist again? F-I-L-A, Brasilia, B-R-A-Z-I-L-L-A? Yeah, got it. Brasilia, via Brasilia. Yeah. And I'm trying, the, um, oh, what was the first album? It was the one that had the sheriff on it, um. Uh, That was from the album uh, Old Codes, New Chaos, which was released in 94. And the first time I heard it, I was blown away. I'm like, this is a type of music I've never heard before. Okay. Oh, I And check it out. <laughs> I got obsessed with it. Yeah. yeah so. Okay. Okay. Like left field. Like left field was something that I, I hear left field quite often on the... Um, yeah. on the station as well also on the classic yeah. one mm -hmm. the Groove Salad classic yeah. oh left field is there's this whole there's this whole yeah there's this whole like movement in UK music it was like you know for the chill rooms at the raves and uh, I remember someone said they it sort of started when someone played a 12 inch that was cut at 45 at 33 and instead of it being a dance song it came out real and they go wow that's really cool yeah like emancipator and, and things like this yeah <laughs> yes and then and and then uh more and more people started uh you know doing stuff in that genre and uh there's this whole scene in uh in the t 
town of Hull in the UK and where uh, Feel of Brazil was based, but a whole bunch of other people, like, you know, I guess it, it was sort of like people would go to the clubs there that they were playing at and hear that music and want to make it themselves. And, uh, and then it like spread out from there through England. Rusty, thank you so much for your time. I, I hey, appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. I appreciate it so it's much. Been, you have no idea. Fun. <laughs> so, um, it's like it's you've been such a big part of my life. Like with your choice of music, with uh, Soma FM, and uh, with Groove Salad, with all the other stations that are on there, all like all the other DJs and uh, the people that are playing the music there. It's like thank you, like, every single one of them. Please say hello from my side. I will. Them. And on behalf of all of us, thank you for listening. That's, that's for sure and I will keep on listening and I will um, always spread the word yeah, to everyone out there um, Yeah, tune in to uh, Soma FM there's an app for your phone you can listen to it online There's you can see all the playlists which I think are very helpful because sometimes you listen to something like oh what is it and even Shazam doesn't know this song so you, yeah. but you can go to the playlist and uh, you can find it out what it is and you can go to Bandcamp you can support the people that uh, produce this uh, great stuff and you can also support Support Soma FM by donating money. Um, you get a free T-shirt. I think fifty dollar more. <laughs> It's yeah. very cool as We well. Have T-shirts and mugs and other stuff like that. Yeah, nice. Well, so, thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, I say goodbye from my side. Maybe you can tell um, the listeners um, where they can find out more about you. Maybe there's uh, something um, I missed, and I will link it in the show notes uh, when you tell us now. And yeah, I say goodbye from my side. And if there are any final words, now is the time. For it. Okay, I'll just, I'll just say go to somafm.com, S-O-M-A-F-M.com, and uh, browse the channels, and you click on each channel, and there'll be a little bit, there'll be a blurb about the DJ and the music director for that channel, and the style of music it is, or just listen and enjoy. There's a lot of really neat stuff there. Thank you, and goodbye. All right, well, hey, thank you very much. 